So again, good afternoon. Uh, again, Timothy Crowley, Senior Director of Housing Strategy for Catholic Charities USA. We want to welcome you to today's webinar. Before we get started and I introduce our distinguished uh, panel, we'll go through a few logistical items just so you know how the webinar uh, operates. Uh, the first thing is that the webinar is being recorded and will be available on the CCUSA website. And also, uh, after the webinar, uh, within the next 24 to 48 hours, for all of those who are participating, we'll forward uh, a copy of not only the, uh, the recording, but the presentation itself. So uh, just know that if you miss anything or uh, didn't get a question in or anything like that, you'll certainly have an opportunity to get a copy of the webinar and, and the recording and then can follow up accordingly. Uh, during the course of the webinar, your phone line or, the, or your computer speakers will be muted, so that way not to interrupt the panelists. When we get to the end and open it up for um, questions or, uh, or questions or and answers, uh, you're, you will be unmuted, unmuted and will be allowed to ask questions over so that our speakers can hear them directly. You also have the opportunity to use the chat feature that you can see on your screen for the webinar. And so throughout the webinar, if you want to um, text in, type in uh, comments or questions, you can do that. And to the degree that it is manageable, we'll may even integrate some of those questions over the course of the webinar. If not, we'll certainly make those available and, and discuss those at the end. Um, again, all questions that are not addressed during a webinar, you will be able to get an email response. You'll see a slide at the end with, with my name and address. And so I, I certainly encourage you, anything that comes up uh, that we aren't able to address during the course of the webinar or certainly afterwards, you can shoot me an email and we'll make sure to get your response uh, in writing via email, okay? So, as we get started, just a couple of quick things in terms of webinar goals. Again, uh, really excited uh, in terms of this opportunity with, the, with HUD, in terms of 202 projects having the opportunity to uh, use the rental assistance demonstration program to restructure, and specifically the 202 PRAC projects. With that in mind, there's a couple of goals we've laid out that hopefully uh, uh, you'll, you'll learn throughout the webinar or, or, or gain throughout the course of the webinar. The first is really learn if your 202 properties qualify for the HUD Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, because this is really uh, geared toward uh, PRAC properties. Uh, two, understand how you can recapitalize your 202 projects and earn new fees. And hopefully that's something exciting to uh, all of you uh, with agencies as, again, not only be able to kind of refresh your projects, but earn fees that could go towards other development efforts or, or other activities that your agency may be doing. And finally, have a clear understanding of how the 202 RAD program works and when is the right timing for your projects. And so we're fortunate to have a group that uh, really experts in affordable housing, affordable housing development, and I think they'll be able to share with us uh, some of that information uh, over the course of the webinar. So with that being said, I want to introduce our, our distinguished panel, and we're, we're really so pleased to have um, uh, the four persons that you see uh, as the panel members on the slide. They all bring a, a great deal of expertise and, and background as it relates to affordable housing um, and uh, around 202 projects. Our first person is Deborah Van Ambergen. She's with uh, Nixon Peabody uh, LLP. Um, Deborah is a strategic policy advisor in Nixon Peabody's affordable housing practice group. Uh, she served as chair and member of a number of board and agencies uh, dealing with affordable housing, including the National Council of State Housing Finance Agencies, Low Income Housing Tax Credit uh, Task Force, um, working with Affordable Housing Finance Magazine, as well as with several boards and advisory groups in New York State. Uh, she is also a participant in the National Housing Rehabilitation Association and the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition. So thank you, Deborah, for, for uh, participating. Our second uh, person is Megan Altador. Megan is also with Nixon Peabody. 
Uh, Megan represents nonprofit and for profit developers in acquiring, constructing, rehabilitating, and operating affordable housing developments around the country. Megan is a member of the New York State Bar Association, uh, the New York City Bar Association, and the American Bar Association Forum on Affordable Housing. And she also has uh, provided pro bono counsel to a number of uh, nonprofit housing boards. So thank you, Megan, for, for joining us. Our third panelist is Mr. Sam Rotter. He's with the MMS Group. Uh, Sam is a certified public accountant and chartered global management accountant. Uh, he's graduated from Temple University with a bachelor in business administration. Uh, Sam has served as executive general manager for the Philadelphia Housing Authority, where he was responsible for over 20,000 units of subsidized rental housing and in charge of finance information systems and asset management. And so Sam has a, a lot of background experience in terms of these types of projects. So welcome, Sam. And last but not least, um, we have Mr. Tony Savaris. And Tony and his team at SAV, um, he has been providing pre-development funding and development services to nonprofits for the preservation and development of affordable housing. Um, they're particularly skilled at offering nonprofit owners of HUD FHA affordable housing projects the resources uh, really needed to maximize the benefits of, of the various HUD programs that are out there. Uh, Tony also specializes in the negotiation, management, implementation of successful uh, relocation efforts in terms of affordable housing projects uh, and, and doing this in compliance with all federal, state, low income housing tax credits rental assistance demonstration project, project regulations. And so again, thank you, Tony. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to Deborah and Megan, and they will start us off with uh, some understanding about what uh, RAD for PRAC is and, and get us going. So Deborah, Megan, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Tim, and nice to be on the line with all of the great folks from Catholic Charities. We appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the RAD for PRAC program. Um, if you go to the next slide. <clears throat> so the RAD program has been around since 2011, and HUD has issued guidance on it a number of times. This is uh, the guidance on RAD for PRAC is in the fourth revision of the RAD notice known as Rev4 by uh, the HUD Speak world. So you can go to the next slide. Um, the notice is available on the HUD website, and uh, this is just a minor point, but anybody who had looked at the RAD notices before, they had originally issued one in 2012, and they kept updating that. Now they've issued it as a new notice with a 2019 number on it, so it's a little bit easier to find. And in addition to updates to other types of buildings covered by the RAD program, there is a new section in the notice, which is the guidance on RAD for PRAC. Um, some people may recall that the authority to enter 202 PRAC buildings into the RAD program was first enacted by Congress last year in 2018. Earlier this year, HUD put out draft notice and uh, draft guidance on it. Um, we actually did a webinar with the Catholic Charity folks around that time to talk about what was in that draft, and um, now they have finalized it based on feedback from the industry. So we're here to talk about what is in that final guidance. The main goal of the uh, going into the RAD program would be to convert what your, are your current PRAC contracts to long-term Section 8 contracts. Um, my colleague Megan is going to talk a little bit about the types of buildings that are covered by this and, and what's not. Great. Thank you, Deborah. So again, this is Megan Altador from Nixon Peabody. Pleasure to be with you all today. Um, and this next slide up here is intended to answer the webinar goal number one, which is whether or not you are eligible. Uh, so as you can see here, there have been three iterations of the HUD 202 program. Um, and the one that we're really concerned about is the last one, 1990 to the present. So one key way you can tell whether or not you're eligible is if your HUD 202 documents were dated from 1990 to the present. In the previous iterations, uh, for example, from 1959 to 1974, HUD was providing direct loans uh, without any subsidy 
So when you're prepaying those type of projects, you can actually get tenant protection vouchers um, and you're not looking at a RAD conversion. The next iteration of the HUD 202 program uh, from 1974 to 1990 were direct loans to the projects with long-term Section 8 project-based rental assistant con assistance contracts. So in that category, you already have a, a long-term Section 8 contract and you don't need a RAD conversion. Um, but in our category, 1990 to the present, these are projects that received what are called capital advance documents. Um, they look and smell like loans, they're notes and mortgages, uh, but they're in fact not loans because if you look at the note, there's some language that it's deemed paid and discharged so long as you comply with the long-term restrictions on maintaining the housing uh, for, for very low-income elderly residents. So you have in these projects, you have a capital advance note, a capital advance mortgage, a capital advance use agreement, and a capital advance regulatory agreement. And then you have a, a rental subsidy contract that's called the Project Rental Assistance Contract, or what we call the PRAC. So again, if your documents are dated from 1990 to present, if you have capital advance documents, or if you have a PRAC, then you're eligible uh, for this RAD conversion that we're talking about today. So now Deborah's going to talk a little bit about the rent setting. If we could go to the next slide. Right. So I think, you know, anybody who has a PRAC contract knows that right now you go into HUD, you can go as frequently as each year, and you apply for a budget-based rent increase. The local HUD office processes that rent increase, approves or doesn't approve it, and you get, they get your renewal for that year. Um, that is very restrictive and you uh, you know i'm sure know that it would be very hard to do financing based upon a one-year contract any lender would want to see a longer term contract so that's really the goal of the of putting these buildings into the rad program so you would get a 20-year contract the initial contract rents are limited by the lesser of two things what your current prac rents are or up to 120 percent of the fair market rents for project-based rental assistance contracts and 110% of the fair market rent for project-based voucher contracts. Very briefly, if you're not familiar with the terms PBRA or PBB, PBRA or project-based rental assistance is what uh, is a direct contract with HUD that is administered by the, the local HUD office. A project-based voucher contract would be with a local Section 8 agency. So that could be a local public housing agency or a local community development office. Um, I'm going to go into, in a moment, the reasons why we expect that the vast majority of sponsors would choose to go with a project-based rental assistance contract. Um, whichever contract type that you take, and once that, that initial rent setting is done, the project will then get operating cost adjustment factor or OCAF increases for an initial 20 year term. And those OCAF increases, again, if anybody's not familiar with them, are essentially a cost of living increase. So HUD looks at you know, how much utility if, uh, prices are going up and other expenses in, in a market and they set by state OCAF increases. So these would be automatic increases as opposed to having to go through the budget-based rent increase process like you do right now. You can go to the next slide. As I mentioned, we expect that most sponsors will do project-based rental assistance. First of all, you're used to dealing with HUD. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you go to these slides that moved around? I'd like to be on slide 11. Next one. Nope. Okay, I, we may be missing a slide. You can go back to the one on. Uh, yeah. Um, so sorry about that. We, we had a little confusion in the order of the slides. Project based rental assistance, what we expect most of these sponsors will choose to do. Um, it would be a 20 year contract with HUD. As I said, you're dealing with HUD right now. HUD, you're used to dealing with HUD. You will have a use agreement with HUD going forward. So there's not a lot of reason to go project-based vouchers. There's also some quirks in the project-based voucher um, structure, which is mentioned here on this slide, that you would have to um, be timed to correspond with your PRAX expiration and then need to have the funding actually moved over from the 
current multifamily side of HUD over to the public housing side of HUD to have that created as a project-based voucher contract. So the rent limitation is lower and you'd be dealing with a local housing authority or a local section eight agency and the timing is more complicated. So we think most people will end up going with the uh, PBRA choice. Uh, Megan's gonna now talk a little bit about um, what sponsors can do with the proceeds. Sure, thank you. So there are some exciting things in the, in the new notice about use of proceeds. Um, and I wanna talk specifically about what happens under a sale or refinancing. So in both cases, um, you, can, you have some restrictions on the use of proceeds and they're going to, to go out for the term of your original capital advance use agreement. So if your use agreement was going to be in place until 2020, 2035, for example, you would see these restrictions for that period of time. Um, and so your proceeds will have to be used to benefit the project itself or the residents, and that could mean service delivery, or that could mean capital improvements, um, or for affordable housing purposes. So there's some interpretation uh, that would be up to HUD as, as to what affordable housing purposes means, uh, but there is some, some guidance in the new notice that is helpful. Uh, I'm only gonna talk a little bit about specifically what's relevant for sales, uh, because I'm assuming this audience is not necessarily looking to sell existing 202 properties. Uh, but if you were looking to sell, um, there is some guidance in the new notice saying that you can use the sales proceeds for some of the sale costs. So for example, if you had to pay transfer taxes or broker fees, uh, you could use any of the proceeds for reasonable third party transactional costs. You could also use some of the proceeds for withdrawal of sell seller equity. Um, and there's, there's some guidance in the notice that basically provides that you can use more, you can withdraw more seller equity based on how long you've been operating the project. So an example would be if you had a $2 million capital advance note and you were 20 years into your 40 year term, uh, you could get $1 million of unrestricted seller equity in that situation. A final consideration for sales is that you could pay down identity of interest loans or advances that had been made for the project. Uh, and we see that a lot with sponsors who have to put in their own money since these projects have really been operating at cost. So you would be able to pay yourself back if that had been the case. A consideration going forward in terms of use of proceeds is that you can take surplus cash distributions. Um, provided that you maintain an operating reserve. And the requirement is that you have $250 set aside per unit in operating reserve, in an operating reserve. And that could be, if you have a new lender or investor and they require an operating reserve, you could use that requirement to meet this HUD requirement. Um, and HUD is not looking to approve each withdrawal from the operating reserve. They would in fact just be monitoring through the, the submission of annual financial statements to make sure that you're setting aside this money for the continuing operation of the project. And so we're gonna, I think we have to go forward uh, a slide so that Deborah can talk about Davis Bacon requirements. Thank you, Megan. So we wanted to put this slide in here because HUD's policy on whether Davis-Bacon wage rates would be applicable to rehabilitation work done at properties going through the program has shifted over time. So if anyone's not familiar with Davis-Bacon, it is a federal law that requires wage rates be set at a certain level, and those levels are published by the Federal Department of Labor. And it is a cost factor when you're doing rehabilitation to a property. Typically, Davis-Bacon wage rates are higher than what you might be able to price the re rehabilitation work at using a, a contractor who doesn't pay Davis-Bacon wage rates. There are contractors, some who do and some who don't. If you're forced to do Davis-Bacon, the rehabilitation work is going to cost you more. That construction contract will be more expensive. So this has been an important debate. It's been going on, um, you know, as I said, the RAD program's been around since 2012. HUD has shifted its position. We, the reading of the guidance in this, and I think the way that most RAD conversions for crack properties will happen would be that Davis-Bacon would not apply. 
So it doesn't apply to anything that's previously unassisted. And previously unassisted would mean a unit that's not receiving subsidy would now be getting a subsidy. So if you think of your typical Section 202 PRAC building, say it's 50 units, you have 49 or 50 units on the contract. Maybe you have a supers unit that is the one that's not on the contract. You would convert it from your PRAC over to a new Section 8 contract. That Section 8 contract covers those 40, same 49 units. Therefore, no Davis Bacon applies. The only exception to that is if you were to apply it to previously unassisted units. And you might say, well, why would I be doing that? Or how would I do that? And I think uh, Tony and Sam, when we get to their portion of this, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the flexibility to move assistance around. If you had a building that was truly in need of you know, relocating the tenants. Um, most buildings that have been built since 1990 would not be in that situation, but it could happen that a building really has reached the end of its useful life. Maybe it was a rehab when it was first done and you want to relocate the tenants. If you were to move the new contract and move the tenants to a new facility, that would trigger Davis-Bacon. So I think it's a relatively rare circumstance where that would come up, but it could happen if you were trying to do something, you know, a little bit more creative with your structuring. Megan's now going to cover some of the other key features in the HUD guidance. Great. Thank you. So this is slide number 13. Uh, and so let's cover a few more features of the, the new guidance before turning it over to Sam and Tony. Uh, and the first is that, and I think this is very important to say, all of your existing capital advance use restrictions, including the capital advance note and mortgage, are going to be released. So. The as I mentioned before, you have a capital advance note, capital advance mortgage, regulatory agreement, and use agreement. All of those will be released. You're going to have a new elderly housing use agreement put into place. It's going to have a term of the existing use agreement plus 20 years. Um, and again, the, the best part here is there's no need to pay off that existing note and mortgage. Um, it goes away in connection with the RAD conversion. Another feature to mention is that social services are required as part of the RAD conversion. So the RAD notice in particular notes the critical role of supportive services uh, for the abil ability of these elderly residents to age in place. And you are gonna have to demonstrate to HUD that their needs are being met on a consistent and long-term basis through a service coordinator or some other kind of arrangement that you've made um, and one note related to that is that HUD has provided guidance in the notice that they will approve up to $27 per month per unit to be included in your PRAC contract prior to conversion for social services specifically. Um, and that is a waiver since previously there was a limit of $15 per month per unit. Um, so you are able to, if you're planning to go into the RAD conversion, increase the amount dedicated to social services um, prior to submitting a RAD application. I want to talk a little bit about nonprofit involvement, since I know there, in connection with this RAD notice, there's been a lot of interest from for-profit owners, and perhaps some of you have gotten phone calls um, from for-profits who are interested in trying to partner with you in a RAD conversion. Um, so the notice does allow for profits to participate in the ownership of these projects with restrictions. So for the term of that capital advance use agreement, um, there are requirements that the nonprofit basically continue to control. Um, the, the basic rubric is that the nonprofit would control 51%. So if you had a partnership, the nonprofit would need to be the 51% general partner or general partner in that ownership entity. There is some Guidance, however, that, for example, you could look at a structure where the nonprofit is the lessor under a ground lease, or perhaps that the nonprofit holds a less than 51% interest, so long as they still have certain control rights over the project. We anticipate that this will be a matter of HUD interpretation uh, as more owners submit requests with different types of structures. So it's something that we're certainly going to be following to see what HUD approves and where the thresholds um, are as the guidance develops. So a final requirement that I wanna note um, of the RAD for PRAC conversions is that all of the typical features of a RAD conversion would apply. So if you're not familiar with what those might be, that would include requirements to comply with the Uniform Relocation Act, 
um, requirements for site and neighborhood standards and for environmental reviews typical of RAD conversions. There's also a requirement that you secure a 20-year capital needs assessment and that you can show HUD that you're able to address those needs either through your replacement reserves or some kind of new financing. The guidance that HUD has given us says that in order to submit your application, you have to provide a basic summary of what, what the project is and what you're intending to do. And I wanna note in particular that you'll need to consult with residents prior to submitting your application to HUD. So there's a requirement for a minimum of two meetings with the project residents, at least one of which is 30 days prior to the submission of the application. One final note that's not on the slide that I'll make is that there is a provision for transfers of assistance under the new HUD guidance. So that would be a situation in which you could prove to HUD that the project is, is physically obsolete or economically non-viable, uh, which might not be the case today, but perhaps something of interest um, as time goes on and the projects are older and might be in a situation in which they meet those criteria uh, enumerated by HUD. So if we go to the next slide, We've given you a number of resources if you want follow-up information um, about some of what we've discussed. And then after that, I believe we'll move to the next slide and turn it over to Tony and Sam to give you some tips about whether or not the timing is right for you in terms of restructuring under the RAD for PRAC program. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Deborah. That was great. And we appreciate the, the thorough um, not uh, information that you provided for everybody on this critical points. Um, well, what do we do now? <laughs> it's, is the timing right for everybody? Let's take a few minutes to uh, explore this question. And, um, you know, we, we have two slides there, actually three slides that um, touch on some of these important uh, ideas and, and challenges that this, this initiative um, is, is providing everyone. Um, let me just say a few things before we get in. Uh, I turn it over to Sam to talk about some day-to-day -day things and, 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 the, and the world of selling pracs. Um, you know, for those members uh, of CCUSA who participated in our, our previous webinars on affordable housing preservation and development, um, you may recall that we discussed uh, the many ways CCUSA members uh, could preserve their affordable housing portfolio and also maximize asset value to create ways uh, to develop more affordable housing and support related social services. This uh, new solution from HUD uh, to preserve PRAC properties is timely and needed, uh, but I'm not sure it's quite there yet, and we are going to review a few reasons why I say that. There are not many case studies to look at because this initiative is so brand new. Uh, in addition, there currently is, as you heard from Deborah and Megan, a, a budget neutral component that is a major stumbling block to the underwriting process. And so we have these issues related to rents, as you heard uh, Deborah uh, speak to. And um, so that's not to say that CCUSA members should not look into this program. I'm going to suggest quite the opposite. Uh, my initial analysis, as well as discussions with HUD officials, fellow housing professionals like Deborah and Megan, and PRAC owner managers like Sam, is the HUD PRAC owners should begin to pencil out the numbers of a possible financial transaction and sign up with HUD to begin discussions on a no obligation basis. We're gonna give you a, a, a portal where you can sign up with HUD uh, and you might wanna think about doing that. For me as an asset manager of HUD PRAC properties, I have always felt that there was a long-term flaw in the PRAC program, which HUD aggravated when it started to ask everyone for their money back on uh, when they had large residual receipt accounts. Uh, this was money I always viewed as a source for major capital improvements along with the replacement reserve. So let's start with a review by Sam of the day-to-day -day challenges uh, uh, facing PRAC owners across the country. Sam is also going to talk about some of his experience related to the sale of PRAC properties in the marketplace. And then we'll dive into a conversation on 
what I view as HUD's expectations, some general approaches and challenges to underwriting a PRAC for RAD transaction. And of course, possible next steps. Sam? Thank you, Tony. MMS Group is a manager of about 40,000 units nationwide. A number of those are PRACs, that some of which we've managed for decades. Um, so as others have alluded, the post-1990-202 PRACs have operated based upon a zero-based budget. HUD only funded the amount necessary to cover operating expenses and replacement reserve contributions. And it would have been helpful if HUD took into account a physical needs assessment prior to having us return what they deemed to be excess residual receipts funds that built up over time. Wouldn't it be fun to have that money today to spend on, on these capital improvements that many of these aging PRACs are faced with? To make matters more difficult, many HUD offices, especially in New York, have been enforcing the 120-day rule, which meaning that all requests for budget-based rent increases have to be submitted with a physical needs assessment at least 120 days prior to the contract renewal date. To make matters even worse, during the summer, HUD was inundated with requests for rent increases in anticipation of the new RAD notice. They did not have sufficient budget appropriations, so they limited all increases to 5%. On one of our PRAC properties, the rent increase was predominantly due to the need to repair a facade that required almost $3 million. I can assure you 5% was not going to cover a $3 million repair. HUD said that we could accept the 5% or wait in the queue as HUD tries to find funding after the end of the 9-30-19 fiscal year. We're still in the queue today. HUD is trying to find funding, HUD trying to find funding is even further exacerbated by the fact that we continue to operate under continuing resolutions. There's no annual budget in place. Even on, on existing contracts, HUD does not fully fund those in some instances. They will pay subsidy for three months and then stop and, and we have to chase them down to reinstate funding uh, once they locate sufficient appropriations. In addition, HUD will delay releasing contract renewals in some instances if they don't have funding. So these are some of the challenges in the current environment under post-1990 PRACs that we're faced with. Now in this ever evolving new world of RAD for PRAC, we have seen a lot of different approaches. One national investor with about 100 PRACs felt that 50 of their PRACs were in position to be refinanced. They sent in budget-based rent increases over the summer to HUD. I'm not sure how successful they were given the fact that there was this limitation, but under the RAD for PRAC program, uh, I, I, they probably have initiated that process. But again, they submitted those prior to the notice being issued. One of our not-for-profit investors also bought a PRAC in Missouri. That was the first one we saw. That was about a year ago. In New York, one of our owners is refinancing four of their PRACs. Another with one PRAC wants to sell, while another with three PRACs also wants to sell, but included two other non-PRAC properties in the package. Our recommendation to them will be to separate the PRACs from the other buildings and bundle the PRACs with, with the other owners we're working with or other PRACs if, if we can determine who else wants to be involved in this, in this package and bundle them. Under the PRAC program, we can bundle PRACs with owners that agree to be part of that bundle and uh, maximize the rents trying to achieve 120% of the of the FMR, the fair market rent, to maximize the rents across the port, that, that bundle, if you will. And of course, we're interested in, in acquiring PRACs where that opportunity exists. As owners, we proceed from, uh, we're advising the owners of these PRACs that in many instances, they were under the incorrect assumption that they could use the proceeds for general purposes. As we discussed, these 
proceeds from sales have to be used for affordable purposes. Some of that is yet to be defined. So the opportunity lies with those that wish to sell, even though some of those owners wanted to get out of the housing business, uh, it's gonna be difficult for them to do, uh, but the opportunity is there for them to earn fees, developer fees, among others, in building new affordable housing, uh, but it doesn't quite meet the goal of some of those owners in wanting to exit the housing programs. And that's an update on our experience recently. Uh, Tony? Tony? Thank you, thank you, Sam. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Didn't want to interrupt. The um, Thanks again. Let's talk about a couple of uh, basic components of, of applying for this uh, for the, this initiative and moving forward. As you may recall in, in a uh, prior webinar that we had together on, um, and we had basically the same panel, I, I believe Deborah and, and Megan were on that panel as well. We talked about the notice that had come out and one of our recommendations, or at least my recommendation to, to clients and associates was to file rent increases for as much as possible reflecting uh, some preliminary uh, needs to uh, prepare and get the rents up in preparation for this notice. Well, lo and behold, a lot of people did that and suddenly there was a 5% freeze on rent increases. The, rent inc the budget based rent increase, the BBRI as it's called, um, is something everyone's I is very familiar with. In this case, it's an important part of, of the um, application process. And, um, you know, the, in the challenge with the, the budget space rent increase uh, application that, that we're all going to have is that we're going to need to have um, a rent incre increase that's sufficient to get the work done. Um, it's going to need to calculate the necessary replacement reserve deposit for the work. And it's going to have to work within all of the, the restrictions and parameters that uh, Deborah and Megan described and some of the issues that you heard Sam discuss a, a second ago. I have heard, and, and, I, and I don't know if any of the panel members have had this experience or um, have heard this suggestion of rent bundling as a way to um, address the rent issue and getting the rents up to a sufficient level that they could support debt service. Uh, Deb and, uh, Deborah and, and Megan, have you had any experience on that, uh, on that level with bundling several pack, uh, PRACs together and averaging out the rents? Uh, we have not done it in RAD for PRAC yet. You know, I think everybody knows this guidance just came out in September, so I'm not sure that very many deals have re actually moved all the way through the process. Mm -hmm. We have definitely done it on RAD for public housing side of the RAD uh, program, which, you know, again, as, as Megan mentioned in her remarks, there are some parts of the RAD process or program that apply to every category of building that is eligible under it. So. On the public housing side of things, we have successfully bundled rents between properties to blend the income available to the entire, you know, if you look at a project that covers a couple of different buildings and you have different rents, bundling them together can sort of help stabilize both. Mm -hmm. So that has been successful. It's, it's been, you know, fairly easy to do and HUD's willing to do it. I've also heard uh, that you could possibly combine a PRAC with a non-PRAC property, is that correct? Have you heard that as well? Yeah, so I mean, for instance, if, if any of the sponsors on the phone, you know, Megan talked about the different categories of 202s based upon when they were originally financed and mm -hmm. how they were, uh, what, what type of HUD assistance they received at that time. If you have a Section 202 building that has a project-based Section 8 contract on it today, you could go through the RAD program with one of your 202 PRAC buildings, create a new Section 8 contract for that property, and take money from the existing project-based Section 8 202 building and 
transfer those monies over to what had been the Pratt property. Um, and I think some owners have actually been able to get their rents on their traditional Section 8 contracts in their older 202 buildings up fairly high. You know, you've gone as high as a, you know, you, you can do a markup to market under the Section 8 program on one of those traditional Section 8 contracts. So if you were in a market where you had a building that, you know, the, the market rents are actually quite high, you can do a markup to market and then transfer some of those monies coming from HUD for that building over to the other building. Hmm. Okay. Wow. We could, we just want to, we want to make sure that um, we have enough time for questions and answers. So I'm going to oh, ask sure. you, okay. can, sure. can you, can you provide um, our audience some perspective on how they may determine if the time is right for them to consider, uh, you know, sure. a, a Let's, rad, Why don't we go, uh, and, you know, I can tell uh, just very quickly on funding pre-development costs, you know, HUD is going to allow the use of the res residual receipts account for the CNA for the comprehensive needs assessment. There is There may be a challenge to other pre-development costs related to the application process, and that could either be discussed with the HUD office um, or there may be, you know, for example, uh, SAV CS Pre provides uh, pre-development funding and uh, something that we've talked about on other uh, webinars together. Let's just go to this slide now related to the underwriting approaches and challenges and just trying to get into what HUD's thinking and their expectation. It really comes down to, in my view, uh, their, ex their expectation is that you will, we will be able to use the net savings from a lower replacement reserve after completion of work, a lower operating cost due to work and upgrades, and lower or zero taxes from a new uh, abatement uh, agreement to help fund debt service. In addition, what I've heard HUD you know, speak of that would help with this uh, challenge for the underwriting is the use and rollover of the existing, any re existing residual receipts into a new transaction. Obviously, the forgiveness of a capital note, that does present some interesting thoughts, particularly, I think, in the low-income housing tax credit side. Uh, and then securing a local subsidy or gap financing from your local uh, municipality. So our suggestion is, is the timing right for you? We, we believe that the first thing everyone should do is sit down and run the numbers with these assumptions that are under item D, uh, HUD's expectations. I also would recommend that you sign up for the non-binding submission of interest with HUD at radresource.net. And then as I've heard it spoken, I've heard Deborah mention this uh, many times, uh, you know, maybe we wait for HUD-RAD uh, for PRAC 2.0 and to see where they're going. So that's one of the decision-making factors that you'll have. Tim? Um, just to jump in for a second, Tony, it's Sam. So the um, one of the things that was mentioned by HUD headquarters in, in uh, my discussion with some of the folks there is that while the numbers may work today and for some properties that they may not, the, the how, how the, with the 120% uh, FMR cap, at some point in the future, under a different Congress, we don't know when that will be, um, that may be lifted. Uh, so we're, we're faced with that cap today, um, mm -hmm. just as we consider today versus some point down the road, uh, that's one of the things to consider, but it's a variable that no one has the answer to. The other thing to be careful of in these conversions uh, is the, uh, the the pilot or uh, the the tax abatement that you're currently functioning under. Uh, that will let if there's a a, cha a change in ownership structure will often trigger that abatement going away, and you need to make sure that as you just alluded to. Uh, that you have a new abatement in place. And uh, in the case of, of New York, that, that we talked about that quite a bit with, with uh, what uh, New York was willing to offer to replace what they call the uh, shelter rent abatement that many of these pracs here operate under. But it's just something to consider that's really important in terms of looking at your numbers. Tony? 
Tim? It's really, uh, you know, good, good information. Uh, just to make sure, because we do have a number of questions that have come through in the chat, and I want to make sure we can get, get several of those in. Uh, and let me just say to the audience, you know, I know we know that this is a lot of information to absorb, and what we hope this does is trigger some thoughts about your, your 202 PRAC projects in terms of looking at this. Again, we recognize this opportunity has just come forward from HUD, and so it's likely that you have not had an opportunity or this is your first exposure around it in terms of being available. So hopefully this triggers some thoughts about your own projects in terms of this structure and so forth. And most certainly we hope it creates some interest whereby um, uh, you have questions and want more information and we can help uh, facilitate that. So I want to thank again the panelists for that. With that being said, we do have like a number of questions that I want to get out. Uh, also for our audience, we uh, if you do want to ask a question, uh, click on your hand raising tool within the webinar. That'll make us aware that you want to ask a question or have a comment, and that way we can make you live. At this point, though, we had a couple things that came through the chat, and let, let me read, read these, and um, these are for all of our panelists, really. Um, could you speak a little more regarding um, the um, PRAC? 202 projects the, using RAD for them, how they will generate new developer fees. Uh, can you speak to that? So that's probably a, that may be more a, 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 a Sam question or a... Sam, do you want to start off? Well, what's, what's, what's clear to me uh, is that if they're taking the proceeds from a sale or a refinance and investing in new affordable housing, uh, that developer fees could be generated from uh, building the, the, the new af affordable housing. That's pretty clear. Frankly, for the rest of the panel, what's not clear to me is w how they generate fees on on a on an existing property if it's if those funds are not being reinvested, or is that the only opportunity to uh, in reinvested in another project. Is that the only way to achieve those fees? So that's my question. I think sort of the, uh, I, I do I'm think sorry. that the most important thing is to start to begin to pencil out under the various scenarios that you might consider. So the, HUD has opened up the uh, uh, you know, all of the possible affordable housing financing approaches to, to be used under this. It's just whether or not you can get the rents up um, to um, a sufficient level um, to, to, to provide for a developer's fee. And that's going to really, I, I, my initial assessment is that folks that are in a position where rents are, are really good in, in, in places like New York and, and some of the um, uh, Washington DC, et cetera, you know, LA, uh, whereas if rents are, are very low in some of the other areas, there may be some challenges trying to make these transactions work. It, it might be uh, a good idea to wait for HUD crack 2.0. Thank you. Uh, we do have someone on the mic that has a question. I believe it's Chris Vado from St. Louis. Go ahead, Chris, with your question or comment. Chris. Hey, Tim, I'm sorry, I, I accidentally hit that, but actually I, I did think of a question regarding the um, comment made about signing up with HUD on a no obligation basis. So I was wanting to know if um, whichever gentleman brought that up, if he could expand on that a little more. Uh, this is Tony, hi. Uh, there is a, a portal, a, a, a link to a, a portal where you can sign in to um, and and begin working with the with the HUD uh, office on whether you know on the on the process to review and to go over with them. And uh, Deborah, do you have any other uh, uh, thoughts on that? You know the uh, the portal that they've set up at HUD uh, related to that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, HUD, HUD wants sponsors to come into this program. They recognize that a lot of these buildings are older, 
need rehabilitation and they're also looking to demonstrate to back to Congress, you know, Congress enacted the, the ability for the 202 PRACs to go into the RAD program. They want to go be able to go back to Congress and say, yes, this generated a lot of interest. The fact that it's non-binding, I think, is, you know, to everyone's benefit. You can put in an expression of interest. And that way, if you want to talk directly to someone at HUD about your project and ask questions, you'll be sort of on their radar. But you are in no way bound to actually going into the RAD program itself. You don't have to follow through on it. You can do it kind of as an exploratory basis. So I think HUD has an interest in having owners come in, like I said, to promote the program. And to the extent that we hope to get more flexibility on rent setting, for instance, I think it would be good for HUD to be able to say to the Congress, oh, we have, you know, 700 expressions of interest, but a lot of those deals really don't work because of the way you've set up rent setting. As opposed to if they have, you know, 10 expressions of interest, it's yes. harder for them to make the case that this is a really big need. Oh, that's a very good point, and it would be extremely helpful to move the question of rents along if people were to sign up and that were the case. And, and so in the document that we, we, we've shared, there's a, a link to radradresource.net. And as Deborah said, you, you can submit, uh, you can provide a non-binding submission of interest. Uh, and that would begin the process with the, uh, with the, the applicable HUD uh, office. Yeah, and Tony, the notice says very specifically that HUD will take no adverse action for any owner that submits an application. So they're very clear. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> it sounds like a good opportunity. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, we do have another question. Um, I think it's for any one of our panelists can take this. Uh, can you confirm that the age distinct provision will be allowed to continue under a RAD conversion? particularly to those units that meet accessibility standards for the disabled. So if I understand the question you're asking, can you have non-elderly disabled tenants in your 202? Does that, do other people, does that sound like the right question? I don't want to make that assumption. I'm just going <laughs> to leave you the question. But, but certainly yeah, there, I mean, there was a reference, there was a reference uh, to the fact that there was an age distinct provision in the Cranston Gonzalez, which helped establish the 202 frac, um, which even included um, that 5% of units modified for those needing the special features of, accel of, of accessibility. Um, and so I think it said we it saw the issues with mixed age populations that kind of led yep. to that age distinct provision. And so I think the question goes to uh recognizing that is your sense that that will still be allowed to continue under a rad conversion yes it is our expectation to be allowed to continue thank you so we did have um, we have another question um let's see here when you we talk about the uh the hud acceptance of the letters of interest um, and, and Tony, certainly you talked about sort of uh, doing some evaluation of your project. Uh, is it your business then going into that portal and having that communication with HUD will sort of be your best first step? I think so. Uh, it's, it's a good way, particularly for any um, uh, offices or members that uh, don't have that uh, uh, that, that broad uh, development and ownership French that maybe others do. There, there are some in, across, you know, as, as we were talking about, Tim, the other day, you know, there's some folks that have just a ton of, of experience and, and, invent, and portfolios, whereas there are some that are either looking to get into um, or um, are, have, you know, just a few or a handful of PRACs, 202s. Um, we certainly are available to always help in as part of our uh, commitment to CCUSA for folks who are looking for you know, some initial uh, uh, answers to questions. And at a, a minimum, I think the HUD office uh, and, the, and the link would be a good place to start. Um, uh, and then as you yeah, build up and get... Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Tony. I thought you were done. Go ahead. Nope. Nope. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, so for anybody who hasn't interacted with this part of HUD, 
The RAD program is run by what's known as the Office of Recapitalization. It is a centralized office in Washington, D.C. And they all they do, well, they do, I shouldn't say all they do, most of what they do is just work on RAD transactions. So it would be a different conversation than going in and dealing with the account executive in your local field office who you deal with on your budget-based rent increases and releases from reserves and stuff. These people at the Office of Recapitalization are what's known as transaction managers. So they are there to help project sponsors figure out how to make their property work and how to get deals closed. So it's really a very different kind of resource um, than you might be used to getting from HUD. Um, they're very much committed to the success of the RAD program and working to help sponsors, owners, management firms to figure out how to recapitalize their buildings. You know, like I said, it's called the Office of Recapitalization and they really take their name seriously. So I do think it's a great, in addition to, you know, I would reiterate what Tony said, you know, Megan and I are happy to have preliminary conversations with folks too. But if you want to talk directly to someone at HUD, they're really a great resource and they're to help you figure out whether this program, whether, whether you can make this program work at your property. I think we have time for one more question and uh, something that came through the chat and I'll, I'll pose it. Um, as a nonprofit sponsor of a 202 property, what would be some of the benefits to consider in partnering with a for-profit partner? So I can, I can take that initially and then let anyone else chime in. I think the benefit would be if you were going to bring in new financing, for example, if you wanted them to take on the guarantee risk, um, or if you wanted to do some kind of larger transaction, we talked about combining with other projects. Um, if you don't have that many projects in your portfolio, if you were looking for expertise, I mean, I'm sure that many of the organizations on the line have significant in-house expertise and might not need a developer partner. Um, but I think those would be the, the reasons when we see smaller 202 owners, um, you know, they might just want not, not want to take on additional risk. And they might not have the in-house expertise to do a, you know, more more complicated transaction. But again, that might not be relevant for this audience here. Oh, I, I totally uh, agree, and I think the guarantees part, for example, in in a uh, tax credit transaction, if if a PRAC was uh, able to do um, that type of of affordable housing transaction, that would be an important consideration. Uh, and then, as you said, Megan, the expertise I think is 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 very important. So, with that, I'm going to thank uh, our panelists for for all that excellent information. This is really very informative. Uh, even now, I see we have a couple of things coming through, and I'm going to follow up with questions to you all, uh, and then we'll we'll respond to um, we'll get a response for those and forward it to our um, to our audience. Uh, hopefully for our audience, this gives you some perspective on how the RAD PRAC 202 process works and just gives you some food for thought in terms of how you may want to proceed. Uh, we're going to make available the overall presentation, and with that, we're also going to include a, uh, a sheet that kind of speaks to some of the acronyms that were used throughout the presentation, so that way you'll, you'll be clear in terms of what some of those things uh, stand for if you, if you miss anything over the course of the presentation. So. Again, on behalf of uh, Cabin Chairs USA, I want to thank, thank all the panelists. Uh, again, you were fantastic. Uh, you all have my email address. Uh, you see that on your screen. Feel free to, to send me an email. Again, if we miss anything and you need clarification, send that. You'll get an email uh, the next day or two regarding the availability of the presentation as well as the, um, the conversation that took place for the webinar. And so you'll have all that information. So with that, we're going to close up this webinar. Again, thank you for participating. For participating. Thank you again to the panelists. And we're going to wish everyone a safe and happy holidays. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.